Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Eck and you're watching ECMATH. Today we're going to talk about section 1.3, function analysis. And specifically this is going to be the first video in our series on function analysis where we covered the concepts of in, uh, positive, negative, increasing, decreasing, and minimum, maximum, which are the uh, main ways that we're going to analyze a graph. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the idea of positive, negative, zero, and intercepts. So I have produced a graph right here that uh, the equation is given above. It's x minus 2 quantity squared times x plus 1. Uh, this would be a third degree polynomial because you have a degree of 2 on the first factor and a degree of 1 on the second factor. You could, of course, multiply them together, but it's perfectly valid to leave them multiplied apart. Um, so then there's a series of questions down the side that we're going to address. First, uh, it's going to ask, where is f of x equal to 0? And another way of talking uh, or of, of uh, thinking about this question is, what are these zeros of f of x? Uh, the zeros of f of x are the x-intercepts. So we can identify where those are on the graph. It looks like there are these blue points right here where the graph itself crosses the x-axis. I can see that the points... It's a little small, but the points are labeled at negative 1, 0, and 2, comma, 0. So I would say that the zeros, when I list the zeros, I'm going to give the x values, because I've already told you that the y value is 0. So I will say that the zeros are at x equals negative 1 and 2. And that's how you answer that first one. The second question, where is f of x greater than or equal to 0? One thing to think about when you see a question like this is f of x you can think about as saying, where is y greater than 0? So what I'm going to do is look at the graph, and using this red pen, just kind of shade in on the graph anything where the y coordinate or the y value would be greater than 0. That is, the upper half of the graph. Now I'm going to be extra careful because I notice that at this blue 0, I'm not greater than 0, I'm equal to 0. So I'm going to do kind of an open circle and skip that point and then continue on this way. Uh, we are going to assume that these are arrows on the end of each function. And so where is f of x greater than 0? I could express this in two ways, as an inequality. So I might say that um, it is between x from negative 1 up to x equals 2, and uh, from, what would we say, uh, x greater than 2. But probably more appropriately and more often how you'll see this is expressed as an interval notation or as a union of two intervals. So I would express this because these are strict inequalities. I'm going to use parentheses and I'll write negative one comma two union two comma infinity close parentheses. For the next question f of x less than 0, I'm again, I'm looking at the y values and trying to decide where the y values are less than 0. So I'm going to go to the graph and uh, shade in any point that is underneath the x-axis, any point that would correspond with a negative y value. Again, assuming that there is an arrow on the end of the function uh, and also skipping this point because the blue point is, of course, where uh, y would equal 0. So then as an interval, well, as an inequality, I would say uh, x less than negative 1. But as an interval, more appropriately, I would write negative infinity up to negative 1 parentheses. Finally, the uh, last question that it might ask you is what is the y-intercept? Uh, and it might also ask you to say, what is f of 0? Because these are actually the same question. The y-intercept happens when x equals 0. So I can go over to the graph. I can look at the points. I guess I colored over it already. But I can observe, ooh, different color here. I can observe that actually at the point 0, 4 uh, is when x equals 0 or where it intercepts the y-axis. So I would say that the y-intercept is at y equals 4. I could also probably give the y-intercept as the coordinate 0, 4. I would accept that as well. Um, finally, I wanted to ask kind of a bonus question. Uh, what if it had said instead, and sometimes you'll see this in the question, so it's going to depend on the question wording. What if the inequality had been inclusive? What if it said, where is f of x greater than or equal to 0? 
Well, in that case, then you would be looking at all points where f of x is equal to 0, where the y value is equal to 0, or all points uh, where the y value is greater than 0. And so you would no longer have to do this goofy weird interval thing, and you would in fact just be able to list this entire shaded region uh, that I've just colored in in yellow. And so if it was this question, instead of the strict inequality like we answered above, I would report negative 1 up to infinity, parentheses, and it would actually be simpler. But it's really important that you look at the symbol, because the symbol specifically is going to affect whether your answer is able to be combined like that, or if you're going to have to skip over all the zero parts like we did in the first part of the question. So this first set of questions is really just asking things about the graph that are immediately visible. Where is the graph above the x-axis? Where is it below? Where does it intersect the y-axis? And where does it touch the x-axis? So these are things that you could obviously see from a graph. But now we're going to start talking about things that you can still read from the graph, but are a little less obvious, kind of the second level of graph properties. And those are the ideas of increasing, decreasing, and constant. This is going to be the same graph as before. We're going to answer these three questions. And I am not going to officially define the notion of increasing, decreasing, or constant yet because there are some technicalities in the definition, but I think the answering the question does not require knowledge of the technicalities. So we're going to do the question first and then the definitions later. Um, one thing when you're reading about increasing or decreasing is that it's important to read the graphs from left to right. We have a tendency, like I do as well, to read graphs kind of from the center and like start at the, the, the intercept and read from this direction and then read backwards from that direction. And maybe it's because of how the arrows point or whatever. And if you're reading in that way, you might say that that red arrow I just drew is actually decreasing because that's the direction of the arrow. But that would actually be incorrect. Um, when you read these graphs from left to right, we're going to say that f is increasing any time that as you go from left to right, um, x goes, nope, not x, y goes up as we go from left to right. So starting at this bottom arrow, I'm going to say, all right, as I travel from left to right, is the graph going up? Yes, it is. So I'm going to shade in this entire area, go right over that zero, because it's not asking us about the intercepts. It's just asking us about now kind of the trend or, or slope of the graph. It's not a, a line. It doesn't have slope. Uh, but it does have kind of a trend upwards. Now I'm going to get to this top point and I'm going to make an open circle here because there's going to be something in our definition that says that you're not actually able to be increasing on a single point or that those top and bottom points, those peaks and valleys, don't actually count as increasing or decreasing. They just count as uh, peaks and valleys. Um, and we'll, we'll get to those in a little bit. Um, so I shaded in red all the way up to zero. I'll write that down now. So I'm increasing from negative infinity all the way up to zero. And I should write that as an inequality too. Uh, so I would say um, x less than zero. I'm not writing less than or equal to because I'm trying to exclude that point. Okay, now the graph does something different for a while and then it goes all the way down to down here and then it starts increasing again as we read from left to right. So I'm gonna have a second increasing interval that starts at x equals 2 and goes up to infinity. So I'm increasing uh, for x greater than 2, which I would write in interval notation by saying, where is it increasing? Negative infinity to 0, union 2 to infinity. Let's look at decreasing. Uh, f of x is decreasing if, as you read from left to right, the y goes down. Now, I can't be both increasing and decreasing, so then my choices are pretty limited. It looks like I'm only really decreasing on this interval right here, from 0 all the way down past 1, down to 2. So I'm decreasing on the interval 0 is less than x is less than 2, which I would write as an interval as parentheses 0, comma 2. Uh, finally, often they will ask you, where is the function constant? In this case, the function is not constant anywhere. Um, a constant function would look like a graph with a flat solid line. That would be an example of a constant function. And so there are functions that do this. It might be a function that curves and then is flat for a little bit 
and then goes up in a straight line. There are totally functions like that. We're going to learn how to graph them in this section, in fact. Um, but this function here has no constant points or constant values. Um, some students are tempted or, or ask me, hey, well, wouldn't technically f of x be constant at x equals 0 and x equals 2? That is, the peaks and valleys. And I would say, uh, I think there are some textbooks that would identify that those are constant values. I would say, however, that you really need to have an interval to be constant, right? How can a single point be constant when constant requires you to, like, have something to compare yourself against? So I would say, uh, in response to that, that, hey, good idea, I see what you're saying, but single points cannot be constant. And so I would not actually include those values in the constant, and I would say that there are no constant intervals on the graph that we've chosen for you today. And there are plenty of graphs, of course, that do have constant intervals, uh, but just none of them here. Um, one other note while I'm kind of on this slide is I did, I was really careful here that I always used what we call open intervals when I'm describing increasing, decreasing, and constant. I never used a closed bracket or a closed parenthesis. And the reason is kind of like, it's kind of the same reason that I uh, said that you could not have single points being constant. Imagine that I said, all right, here's a graph and let me draw, it's just gonna be a straight line. It has an open circle on one end and a closed circle on the other. And I would say, all right, where is this increasing? Well, it's certainly increasing on all of the values along the line, but is it actually, in, if I were to select this dot, is the function actually increasing at that dot? Or is it done? Is it constant? What's going on there? And in fact, over at the graph here, this uh, the one we we're looking at, at that point, 0, 4, is the function increasing because it's the end of the red interval? Is it decreasing because it's the start of the blue interval? Or is it constant because it's in between, kind of averaging between increasing and decreasing? That's a really confusing question. And so you know what we do in math when there's a confusing question? We work around it, and we just choose not to answer it. And that's why when we talk about increasing and decreasing, we're never going to include kind of the endpoints of intervals, and we're always just going to use parentheses, always. Um, no matter what, the, there's no like weird inequality situation like there was with... Um, positive and negative functions, we're only just going to use open intervals, and that's built into the definitions that we're about to talk about. All right, so formal definitions, and this is going to feel a little weird because you might be looking at me and saying, Mr. Eck, I know what it means for a function to be increasing. You just did an example. Why are we doing this? And the reason is that because we're in Math 4, and in Math 4, we want to be really careful about mathematical definitions because we want to get that practice reading them and understanding the definitions are going to help us answer the hard parts of the questions. The easy parts, where a function is obviously increasing or obviously decreasing, those are easy. Having a really precise mathematical definition will help us understand the tricky bits, though. So I'm actually going to define this in three ways. Informal, semi-formal, and then the official most formal definition for a function that's increasing. Um, informal, I would say, the something like the line goes upwards, right? That's like the least formal. If you're talking to someone and you're saying, how quick, how do you do this? You'd probably say, is it going up or down? And all of our other definitions need to kind of match that idea. Um, but then we start to interrogate, well, what does it mean to go up or down? And we talked about how, you know, we want to maybe read the graph from left to right. So in my semi-formal definition, I'm going to include that idea of reading from left to right. And I'm going to say, as x increases, y should increase. Increase. And that's going to be our semi-formal definition that kind of is now also talking about uh, the direction, directionality. Um, but now I'm going to go into the most formal definition. And I want to include in the most formal definition, we need to talk about uh, some notation, because in this graph I've drawn, it's not increasing the whole time, right? It's increasing for a little bit, but then the function is also decreasing, and then the function might be 
increasing again. So we need to talk about, and let me actually extend this. So we need to talk about like what might it mean to be increasing on a specific interval. So in this little example that I've drawn, you can imagine that this highlighted interval is what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to call the endpoints of this interval A and B along the x-axis, so kind of right beneath each endpoint of that interval. And we're going to imagine that within each interval, there's also uh, an infinite number of x's, of course, but we'll say that there's an x1 and an x2 uh, within that interval. And uh, let's talk about now, with this diagram in mind, what the most formal definition might be. All right, I wanted to check my notes for a second. Uh, so the most formal definition will say a function is increasing how do you spell it? There we go. Increasing on an open interval from A to B if f of x1 is greater than f of x2 when x1 is also greater than x2 for any x1, x2 in the interval. All right, so let's take this apart. Um, first of all, it's, it's phrased a little strangely, but I'm using it, I'm phrasing it in the same way that your book does. Uh, so the first part I would read is when x1 is greater than x2. This is basically saying read x from right, or no, from left to right, right? x1 needs to be uh, greater than x2. I've done this wrong. It actually needs to be that x2 should be bigger than x1 to match our diagram. Uh, and similarly, I think I need to have f of x2 needs to be bigger than f of x1. Oops. Uh, well, that's uh, why we have erasers here in life, uh, so we can fix things. Okay, so now I think the definition is good. So we have x1 and x2. For any x1 and x2 in the interval, when it says this, you basically have to imagine that there are randomly chosen. X's. So like this is an example of a definition where you don't get to pick the x. Your definition has to apply for any randomly chosen x's that you might find in the interval. And so in this picture up here, I didn't pick those to be any specific. I just drew them at random dots. Um, then, so we have the idea that we're reading x from left to right, two randomly chosen x's, and of those two randomly chosen x's, the y values are increasing. Right? That is, if the x values are increasing, you're going from x1 to x2, then your y values are also increasing. And that's what it would mean for a function to be increasing on an open interval, and that's what the official definition of this would be. Um, and again, the reason that it specifies in the definition an open interval is because, let's look in this graph, at this endpoint b, you could argue pretty validly that the function is both increasing and decreasing and maybe even constant. And so we just say, you know what, that's confusing. We're going to say that it's only increasing on the interior of the interval, only the highlighted portions, not this weird and the green circles. Uh, and that way our definition kind of works around the difficulty. So here's an example of a function uh, with an interval. Uh, I'm going to use the same function to talk about three, all three of our different definitions here. Um, but I noticed that the increasing interval appears to start, we'll say it starts at A and ends at B. And I noticed that if I have an X1 randomly chosen here and an X2 randomly chosen there, then we'll I'm going to have to zoom in on here. The Y value for X1, which we call F of X1, is definitely smaller than the y value for x2, which I would call f of x2. So I can observe that f of x1 is less than f of x2, so f is increasing on 
the interval from starting at A and ending at B, which is where I specified. So that's how the definition kind of comes into play officially, mathematically. Now, obviously, again, you know what it means for a function to be increasing, probably. And so you're not going to go like, oh, let me think about this definition every single time I do a problem. But we still like to have that definition. Um, I'm not going to write out the whole definition for increase decreasing. We're just going to look at it and notice that it says the same thing. Uh, I might have changed the word order. A function is decreasing on an open interval a, b, if for any x1 and x2 in that interval, as long as x1 is less than x2, that is we're reading from left to right, now I have that f of x1 is greater than f of x2. That means that the y's are going down instead. So it's really just to switch to decreasing. We keep all the words in the de definition the same, and we change that little thing right here. So what interval would be decreasing? Well, it sure looks like it would be this ending interval here from A over to B. Notice how this ends with an open circle, and I'm going to start it with an open circle as well. So we're only really decreasing on the interval in between them. We're inter decreasing from A to B. And what I notice is if I randomly choose an x1 and an x2 in that interval, x1 less than x2, f of x1 is a large number, but f of x2 is a smaller number. Uh, and so since f of x2 was the smaller, then f is decreasing. So that's how I would use the definition to, to prove that f is decreasing on the interval. All right, now what would it mean for a constant interval? And you might be able to guess uh, what I would mean for a constant interval. It's going to be the same definition, but we're just going to change that sign one more time. A function is defined to be constant on an open interval AV if for any x1 and x2 in that open interval, f of x1 is equal to f of x2. And since they're equal, we don't actually care which x1 or x2 is greater. We just say, uh, oh my gosh, here is my constant interval. Pick a random x1 or constant interval starting there and ending there, starting at a, ending at b. Pick a random x1, pick a random x2. Oh my gosh same y values. Um, and again, at least according to our book, we would not say that it's constant at the end point. Um, there are other math textbooks that have a slightly different definition. Um, and then those math books would argue that the, the function's constant at the end points. We're going to stick with a definition that's given contained within our textbook. Uh, but this is something that actually is up for debate among uh, math teachers and math book authors and things. It's not a hugely important debate, but it is something that is, uh, we'll say, non-standard. Just one more topic to go. I would encourage you guys at this point in the video, if your brain is feeling really full of mathematical definitions, to take a little break, walk around for five minutes, and then come back, uh, because it is really easy to just kind of have all this stuff turn into alphabet soup if you don't uh, take care of yourself and make sure that you are really absorbing the information. So if you need to take a break, this would be a good time. Um, but when you come back, unpause the video, and we are here to talk about extrema, extreme values, and maxima or minima. And what, this is a whole lot of Latin words right here, by the way. Uh, so basically what we're talking about are these points right here, the turning points of the function. That's colloquially what we'll talk, uh, call them. Um, first of all, a little bit about Latin. We're talking about the extrema, which is you could think about as extreme values. Uh, extrema is actually a Latin plural, and the singular of that word is extremum. Um, we're also going to be talking about minimums, um, or a minimum, which is the singular, and the plural of minima, minimums, is min, it's I keep saying it wrong. The plural of minimum is not minimums. It's min imma. Just ends with an A. So it's one of those kind of Latin plurals. It's I think it's a, a neutral gender noun. 
Um, and so it doesn't have like the AE ending that you would find in other Latin words. Um, it's just minima. Um, minima. And here we're going to talk, of course, about maxima, which is the plural of maximum. But, so that's what's going on with the words here. Uh, and you will see all of those words kind of interchangeably within the text. Um, extrema is the super category where we talk about minima and maxima. So it's kind of the super group of uh, all of the minima and maxima of a function. Okay, so how do we find minima and maxima in a function, right? We know what, how to say the words now. Um, well, let's see. Minima and maxima is sort of a tricky topic because you could think about a graph, and I'm not going to think about this graph. Let me draw a different graph. You can think of a graph that looks like this, and maybe it looks like a letter M. How many maxima does this graph have? You might, of course, argue that anything can only have a single maximum value, right? That's what maximum means. And so you would argue that this point right here, the highest point, is the maximum. But a mathematician might say, and, and a crafty student might say, yeah, 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 I get you, I see you. But doesn't it also make sense that this point is also a maximum? Because it's certainly like the top of a hill. It might not be the highest hill in the world, but it's still the top of a hill, right? It's like you can climb, you're on Earth. You can climb a mountain that's not Mount Everest. You don't have to climb the highest mountain to have successfully reached the top of a hill. That would be completely absurd. And so in mathematics, we are going to say that both of these, if we have a graph like this, that both of those turning points are considered to be maximums. And that's why we actually use the word relative maximum, because we will be looking at things that are maximum relative to the values around them, but not necessarily relative to the values of the whole function. Uh, it's just like there's like one hill in Chicago, and if I go climb that hill, I will be at a relative maximum relative to the state of Illinois, but I may not be at a relative maximum uh, compared to the entire globe where there are things like mountains. Okay, so going back to our green graph, I would say that the point 0, 4 is indeed a relative maximum. Here is why, and I'm going to give you the definition of relative maximum right here. I might have to zoom in a little bit. A function is going to have a relative maximum value of f of c at x equals c, so I'm just kind of picking a random alphabet letter, uh, if there exists an open interval around C such that F of, uh, wait, such that for any X in the interval f of x is less than f of c. So f of c, remember, was my maximum. f of x is, the idea is any x in the interval is some x near to c, and f of x is less than f of c. Huh? Let's go to the picture. So I'm saying, and I can, I can of course see here that this is at zero, but we're imagining a more generalized world. So I'm going to say this is the c value, and I'm going to say that there's, there exists an open interval around c. Now this open interval is usually pretty small. I'm going to zoom into the picture. The open interval is usually pretty small. Like, I wouldn't go make a large interval here. We're talking about, you know, within uh, 0.01 of C. We don't have to be far away. And what I notice, although I'm going to make it a little farther away for drawing reasons. There we go. And what I notice is that if I pick a random X in here, just right here's a randomly chosen X, and I follow this up to the graph. Here's the Y value, F of X. But if I compare that... 
to f of c, I notice that, of course, f of x is less than f of c. So certainly f of c is larger than x, and the idea of the definition says that, well, I could pick any x in here. I could pick an x on the other side. I'll call that x2. Oh, look. You know, f of x2 is also going to be less than f of c. So as long as your maximum point is taller than every point close to it, then that point's considered the relative maximum. Here's another way to think about relative maximum. Um, if we were in a classroom right now, I would ask the tallest person to stand up. Um, sometimes that person is me. I'm pretty tall. Uh, and then I would say, hey, so right now I'm the relative maximum tallest person in this room. But does that mean I'm the tallest person in the school? Probably not, because we usually have uh, some pretty tall players like on our basketball team or whatever. Um, and then we might even find that tallest person in the school. Maybe they're in our class. And I would say, yeah, but are you the tallest person in the world? Absolutely not. I mean, perhaps, but probably not. Uh, and that's the idea of relative maximum. You only, you're considered a maximum if you're taller than the things around you. Um, so it does not matter for our definition of relative maximum that there are all these points over here on this side that are greater than f of c. Doesn't matter. Um, because this is just a different part of the graph. This is kind of like the Mount Everest part of the graph. Um, by the way, uh, at least we'll talk about the endpoints later. For now, assume that these have arrows on both ends so that it would not be possible to find a highest point on that right side of the graph. Um, and we will talk about what you would do if there was like a closed circle at the end of the graph uh, at the end of this video. I actually want to talk about one more thing with maxima, and it's perhaps, I don't know if it's the most important thing, but it's it's going to help you get your, prop, your homework right. Um, there is a very specific phrasing that mathematicians want you to use, or math teachers want you to use when you're talking about the relative maximum, uh, maxima or maximum. Um, the relative maxima is not a point, it is specifically the y value. And often it will ask you, what are the maxima? And that's where you should say the y value. And it might even say, where do they occur? That is the x value. So if you are taking a quiz and it asks you for the maxima and you give a point, uh, so on this graph, the point was 0, 4, it is entirely possible, and I have done this from time to time, that you get that marked wrong, even though you correctly identified the point. Because you might have found the point on the graph and, and located it, but you haven't actually answered the question that was asked. So, knowing from this graph that the maximum is at the point 0, 4, here's how I would answer the question. What are the relative maxima? Um, so what are the relative maxima and where do they occur? This will always ask in the plural, even if there's only one. I would write my answer as the maximum of y equals 4, and then I would say at x equals 0 is how I would phrase this. You could also uh, omit the y equals and just say maximum of 4 at x equals 0. We would never omit the x equals. I'm not sure why you could omit the y equals, but I think this is probably the best way to phrase your answer here. And what maybe will help you think about it is insert mentally the word value when you see the word maximum. So it's really saying, what is the maximum value of the function, the y value, and then where does it occur? That's the x value. So this is actually really important uh, because you will get questions marked wrong if you, if you state the, even if you have the right point. Uh, the right feature on the graph, you will lose points if you're not talking about it in the correct way. And that's true in, in our class, it's true in calculus, it's true in math later on. Precision matters, even if it's annoying. All right, we're going to talk about relative minimum or minima as well. Um, and if you are tired of hearing me talk, what you could do right now is pause the video, look at the graph, read the definition of relative minimum, and try to answer the question for the f of x as graphed, what are the relative minima? and where do they occur?
take, yeah, why don't you do that? Take five seconds, a couple seconds, pause, answer this question for yourself. Great, and we're back. Uh, so what is the definition? Well, we'll say a function has a relative minimum value of f of c at x equals c. If there exists an open interval around c, this is the same as before, except that we say such that for every x in that interval, f of x is larger than f of c. Or maybe you should read it as f of c, the minimum value is smaller than anything else is basically, let's say min value is smaller than anything else. That's what this definition is saying. Here's the picture again of that. So I'm going to identify that the relative minimum point is right here at 2, 0. That was the C in the definition. And we imagine an interval around C. We could pick a random x in C in the interval and notice that, oh my gosh, f of x is definitely greater than f of c, no matter what, because f of c was the lowest point on the graph within that interval. And again, it does not matter at all that there's this other piece of the graph that's lower than the, the area we're talking about. The idea of relative minimum means that we're just not talking about the other place right now. You uh, might find the shortest person in class, have them stand up. Hi, shortest person in class. You're not the shortest person in the world, though. Probably not. Um, same idea. We're, we're looking just in a local, sometimes uh, we use the word neighborhood in math. We use it in math. It's very friendly. Uh, we're looking in a neighborhood around C. Uh, to describe where the minimum occurs. Okay, so this point here at 2, 0 is the local minimum. Oh, I also use the word, um, our book will use the word relative minimum. Mr. Eck has been using the word local minimum. That's a, just another uh, thing that like some books call them local minimums and maximums. Some books call them relative minimums and maximums. Maxima and minima. Doesn't matter. Math people will, will understand what you're talking about no matter what word you use. But I did check and like on your homework, it does use the word relative. So it's important to know at least that word. Um, so for f of x as graphed, what, uh, again, what are the relative minima and where do they occur? The minimum of y equals 0 occurs at x equals, I'm looking at the graph, 2 is how I would phrase that question. So we give the y value first, and then we give the x value. I know that feels backwards, but it's just how it's done, and it's important to kind of recognize this. Okay, this is going to be a really picky note, but again, it's going to be important because it will determine whether or not a question is marked right or wrong on your homework. So we do care about it. Um, and I want, we've previously just been looking at graphs that, you know, maybe have some swoopies in the middle, but have arrows on each end. Now let's imagine a graph that has a specific specified end point. You know, it's like a, a chopped off piece of a graph. So this graph maybe has an arrow on the left end, but has a closed circle on the right side. According to our book's definition, the end point here that you see, even though it is lower than any other values around it, does not qualify as a relative minimum. Uh, and if you list it as a relative minimum, it will probably throw that back at you and say, uh, incorrect, please fix. This, uh, the book would actually say that this graph has no relative minima. Now, why in the world would the book say that? That seems bizarre. It seems pretty clear that that point is the lowest point. Well, it goes back to the definition. The definition said that you have to have an open interval around your minimum point to be able to test. And if I try, if I go to my minimum point and try to make a little open interval, 
well, I'm okay on the left side because there's a graph, but on the right side, I can't really make an interval around that because there's no function there. So this endpoint kind of like has to be the closing point of its own interval, and I can't make the open interval. So because I can't make the open interval, the definition fails, and we don't consider that a minimum. Now I've, I've taught you that, and hopefully you absorbed it. Now I'm going to put a star on it, which is that many calculus texts, not ours, but many other ones, say that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? So they change the definition ever so slightly so that endpoints do count as min-max. Min um, but that actually is going to depend specifically on which calculus book and which calculus class you have. So all I can say right now is wait and next year listen to your calc teacher. Uh, and they will tell you what the standard is for their class. Uh, but it's just something mathematically, again, that's kind of up for debate. It's based on those fine little words in the definition. Uh, so that's an important note. It's really picky. This is a picky section. All right. I wanted to do a final example for you. I prepared earlier a graph. And we are going to fully analyze this graph. Hopefully I can fit it all on the screen. Let me do a little move here. All right. Um, so this is the graph of uh, the equation 1 tenth x plus 1 times x minus 2 times x plus 3 squared. If you multiply this out, this would be x to the, uh, this would have an x to the fourth. This was a fourth degree polynomial graph. And fourth degree polynomial graphs can get really fun and really interesting and have a lot of good features. Um, and we're going to analyze it fully based on everything we've learned in this video. First, let's identify the domain. Oh, uh, I'm going to put, imagine that there are arrows on each end here. So arrows on each end. The domain will be all real numbers, which you can always abbreviate as fancy symbol R, fancy script R. The range are the y values, so we're going to find the lowest y value, which looks like it's negative 3.2, and since both arrows point upwards, the range will be negative 3.3.2, comma, up to infinity parentheses. Then I'm going to find the zeros, aka the places where f of x equals zero. Uh, now, the maker of this graph has kindly highlighted a lot of the critical points of the graph, so I observe that the zeros are at x equals negative 3, negative 1, and positive 2. By the way, you could have noticed that, this is math hint, you could have noticed that from without even looking at the graph, just by looking at the, th at the factors in the equation. That's going to be a, a nice connection to make in chapter 2. We'll say that's all I want to say about that for now. All right, let's identify where is f of x greater than zero. Uh, so I'm going to shade that in red. Greater than zero is above the axis, right? It's not talking about increasing, decreasing. It's just above the axis. Open circle there because that's where it's equal to zero. Above, 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 above. Open circle. Oh, now it's below. And now uh, it's going to be above again all the way at the end. So I'm going to list these as intervals, but I'm going to be really careful that I have to skip over that 3 where it's strictly equal to 0. So my interval is going to be negative infinity up to negative 3, parentheses, parentheses, union 3 to, oh, no, negative 3 to negative 1. That's that second, uh, like, hump of the graph. Union 2 up to infinity. That's where the graph is greater than zero. The places where the graph are less than zero will be the opposite of that. Everything below the x-axis, and that will be from negative one, again, I'm using the open bracket, up to positive two, another open bracket. Uh, what's next? f of zero, right? So it's different. It's here I'm saying f of 0 is the input. This is asking me for the y-intercept. 
That is what happens when x equals zero. So where does x equal zero? Or when x equals zero, I can see that the y is negative 1.8. Okay. This is going pretty well so far. It's a little tedious, but it's not particularly difficult. Um, the hardest part is keeping track of all the notation. I'm going to clear off my graph, except for the arrows, and let's do increasing, decreasing, constant. Increasing. I'm going to do in green. That's a good increasing color. I'm going to do all the shading first, increasing all the way up to here. Decreasing we'll do in red. Remember we do decreasing from left to right, so as the graph's going down, we'll highlight the areas. Double check that you've covered pretty much the whole graph, right? Like you should have the entire graph covered here except for the turning points. Uh, so increasing, we're going to go, we're only increasing on open intervals. So we're going to go from negative 3 to negative 1.75. And then union, 1 up to infinity. Where is F decreasing? That's going to be the red intervals. So from negative infinity up to negative 3, parentheses, and then union with negative 1.75, and that's decreasing all the way until x equals 1. Remember when you give these intervals, you're giving x values, not y values. Uh, we're not looking at the y values here. Where is f constant? Nowhere. There are no constant intervals. It might, if it's a question uh, on a homework, it might not even ask you about constant. It might even only ask you like one or the other of increasing or decreasing because it's assumed that if you're not increasing, you're probably decreasing. Finally, let's finish by talking about the relative maxima and minima. So first, let's look at the maxima and highlight them. So maxima are the, the high points. There's no high points on either end because there's arrows, but I do observe a high point right here at the point uh, negative 175 and 0.44. So I express my answer by saying I have a maximum of uh, 0 0.44, that's the y value, at x equals negative 1.75, is how I'm going to express my, my observation that that point is the relative maximum. Uh, let's do the relative minima. Now here I do see two relative minima, negative 3, 0, and 1, and negative 3.2. Um, when there's two minima, I would express it just as two sentences. So I would say I have a minima of 0 at, at x equals negative 3. And you can do a little bit of this. Uh, you have a minimum of negative 3.2 at x equals 1. And that would be the best way to express your minima and maxima. And with all of that done, I know it took a little while, you have completely analyzed this function. You have expressed everything that you could possibly want to know about it. And you have done it with the most proper of notation and you have done it uh, very thoroughly. And so that's always kind of the first step in looking at a function is just analyzing it properly. All right, folks, thank you for sticking with me. This has been fun. Stay tuned for the next video where we're going to talk about symmetry tests. But that is definitely enough for now. This has gone quite long. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you guys next time.